has been uh, writing this whole letter, and he's been explaining the gospel in detail. And he's been building slowly through the whole letter in his emphasis on all that God has planned and all that God has brought to pass through the work of Jesus Christ the righteous. And he builds to the point where he explains that before the the ages even began, before the foundation of the world was laid, God knew us. And God pursued those that he would save in Christ. And he, he looks at this gorgeous thing that we know as the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And after he said that, he's reflecting back on the beauty of the gospel. And this is what he says in Romans 11, 33 through 36. Hear these words and let it call your heart to worship this morning. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. And the church said together, amen. Church, we're going to hear uh, our our, uh, band has been preparing uh, a recent uh, version of a very old classic beautiful hymn that many of you will recognize. Uh, The hymn is called Crown Him with Many Crowns. Uh, It's been around for a long time, but there's this beautiful rendition that they've been working on. So I want you to listen to these words and let it call your hearts to worship as we reflect on what Christ has done on our behalf. We're going to be singing this together over the next few weeks. So let's listen together.
thankful for the truth of that song. And like Pastor Matt just said, I'm very excited for us to be able to sing it together uh, sometime in the next couple of weeks in celebration of the fact that Jesus is Lord. Amen? He has risen, conquered death in the grave, and secured our redemption. Can we stand together, church? Let's sing praises to our King this morning. The King of love, my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I am His, and He is mine forever. shepherd this morning. Amen. Let's continue singing together. There's power in his name. Let's sing it. Lost are saved. Find their way at 
the sound of your grace.
Amen. It is good to see all of you this morning. And uh, as Pastor Matt has already emphasized, a lot going on over the next several weeks. And so um, I do know that we have a lot of families that are traveling. We got all these mixed uh, times of spring breaks. And so we'll be praying for safety of travel for a lot of our church family as they're going to be out of town for the next several weeks. And so let's be mindful of that and be an encouragement to one another. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Father, we um, we love you. You are our God. You move mountains. You faithfully save. We offer thanks for the air that we breathe. We thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for the rain that you have provided over the past day. Lord, we thank you that the revelation for the revelation that comes from your creation, to which we are charged to declare with all creation your glory. We acknowledge your authority, and we gladly submit, because you are the one true God, and you're the only one who deserves our complete focus and our complete effort. No amount of energy, no amount of resources can fully express your beauty and your worth, and yet you invite us to come. So that's why we come confidently into your presence and we bring our sacrifices of praise to you. And Lord, we reverently offer our request to you. Our church family needs knowledge. We need wisdom and discernment. We desire peace. Lord, we need physical strength not just so that we can satisfy our own desires and be able to do the things that we would like, but Lord, we desire physical strength so that we can seek to give you glory and honor in our lives, so that we may do the work of the ministry, so that we may go and be an encouragement to those around us. Lord, we need spiritual protection so that we can be salt and light in the world for your name's sake. Yes, physically, we need you. But Lord, we need you to shine light on our motives, to expose, Lord, the sin that we have overlooked. For Lord, we acknowledge that even in our good deeds, there are often times, Lord, that we do not do them for the right reason. Honestly, Lord, we know that even in our best intentions, they're scarred with sin. We claim and are thankful for the sacrificial atonement of the great high priest, our Lord Jesus Christ. We're thankful that our motives and our actions are covered as your children. But Lord, this makes us long for a day when this sin nature will be no more. Where sanctification will be completed and we will be in a glorified state. And as your precious word said, we will be like your son. For, Lord, today, help us to worship with anticipation. Not just reflecting on your goodness of the past or even of the present, but, Lord, rejoicing in your goodness for the future. So we humbly submit to the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in us, sanctifying us through the Word. Lord, help us today as we looked in the, into the book of Judges. Lord, I pray that we will look for ways to practically apply. But Lord, I pray that as we read together and as we, as we teach and as we listen, that Lord, you will be lifted high and above all else and that we will see Jesus. We will see our need for Jesus, not just for salvation, but we need Jesus, Lord, in the day-to-day -day sanctification. Lord, for he is our example but, Lord, he is our Savior. Lord, I pray today that you will be high and lifted up. And all the world will proclaim your great name. So now as we continue to sing, Lord, as we now give, may it be done so not because of something that we have just put into practice, that it's a part of our regular routine, but, Lord, it will be very intentional it will be very thoughtful. 
It will be heartfelt. It will be sincere. So the rest of our service now, we commit to you. We commit our lives to you. We love you. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray and all the redeemed say together, amen. At this time, we'll have our time of giving.
As we continue our study through the book of Judges, we will be reading selected text from Judges chapter 11 and 12. This is the word of our Lord. Now Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. Gilead was the father of Jephthah, and Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. And worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him. After a time, the Ammonites made war against Israel. And when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, Come and be our leader, that we may fight against the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, That is why we have turned to you now, that you may go with us and fight against the Ammonites and be our head over the inhabitants of Gilead. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and leader over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord at Mizpah. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites and said, What do you have against me? that you have come to me to fight against my land. But the king of the Ammonites did not listen to the words of Jephthah that he sent to him. Then the spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed on to Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead he passed on to the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will give the Ammonites into my hand, Then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. And he struck them from Ereor to the neighborhood of Mineth, twenty cities, and as far as Abel. Abel Kiramim, with a great blow. So the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. Then Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. She was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter. You have brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble to me. For I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. And at the end of two months, she returned to her father, who did with her according to his vow that he had made. She had never known a man, and it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went year by year to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite four days in the year. The men of Ephraim were called to arms, and they crossed to Zaphon and said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites and did not call us to go with you? We will burn your house over you with fire. Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead struck Ephraim because they said, You are fugitives of Ephraim, you Gileadites, in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in his city in Gilead. This is God's word. All right, at this time we'll dismiss our children. Thankful for our teachers who have planned and prepped today um, with them. So today we're going to be covering um, almost two chapters full 
And so there's a lot to say. I just want to remind you of just a couple of things in regards to our study of the book of Judges. Our theme is on the, is on the screen here, that there's no king in Israel. And as it's uh, mentioned five times in the book, and therefore the people did what was right in their own eyes. We see the exception of that last week as we were looking at a self-appointed king um, appointed by the people because of his ability to politic. And during that time, the people did what Abimelech said. And it was wrong. It was evil in the sight of God. And much oppression came to the people. So we see in this book no king, and then we see bad king. And now we are back to Gilead has now, um, after last week as we were ending, we were talking about how um, how the people of Israel began to cry out to the Lord. And they began to ask for, for him to deliver them, to send a deliverer to them. But God said that they had been deep into their idolatry. And he said that, go ask your gods. Go ask the gods that you've been worshiping. And let them have the opportunity to save you. I'm done playing this game with you. I'm not, I will save you no more out of this. It, it almost as if God is, is going back on his covenant in Judges 2, where he said, I will keep my covenant with you. But that's not what God was saying. God was saying, I'm not going to stand in between you and the enemy, and the enemy when you willfully embrace the idols, the enemies, my enemies. It says, they say there, I, I repent, I, that they repent. They said that they have sinned. And that's where we left off. And I just want to read you two verses that we find in, in Judges chapter 10, 17 and 18. And it says, the Ammonites, which we just read about, were called to arms, and they encamped in Gilead. And the people of Israel came together, and they encamped at Mitzvah. And the people, the leaders of Gilead, said to one another. Now remember, they're at a state of waiting. They were in a state of wondering if God was going to step in. In the midst of all this oppression. And now the Ammonites have now come to arms. And now more infiltration is coming in to their land. And more oppression. So what do we do naturally when, we're not, when we can't wait on God? We start trying to figure out. How we can fix it. And so it says, And the people, the leaders of Gilead, said to one another, Who is the man who will begin to fight against the Ammonites? He shall be head over all inhabitants of Gilead. How quick they have turned. God, God, help us, help us. We need God. We need the Lord. We need to put down our idols. We need to do this. We need to do that. We need God. We need God. We need God. And now another enemy has come, and now they say, we need a man. How quick we are to now after this oppression. This oppression would actually last for 18 years. And then we are introduced into, into the man that they would seek after in Jephthah. Now, how many of you before today had rec recognized or have heard before the name Jephthah? Okay. Jephthah. Jephthah, in all honesty, is not remembered for, for much good. In fact, in most rabbinic writings, which is not inspired writings, but historical writings, there is a very negative light that is put on the man Jephthah. In fact, before he judged Israel, as verse 7 said um, of chapter 12, for six years, he was an outcast even to his own clan, to his own tribe of Gilead. And what was the reason for that? Although he was a mighty warrior, he was the son of a prostitute. And he was cast out, barred, and said, there will be no inheritance for you. So he lived in the land of Tob. But the Ammonites have come. And, and Gilead, this tribe of Israel, is looking for a leader. They're looking for someone who can defend them and also aid other tribes. And here we see that they made war against Israel. 
in verse 5. And the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. And this is what they said. Hey, 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 buddy. No hard feelings, right? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, that whole thing, you know, I mean, that was some of our parents. We really, you know, they didn't really mean that. We're kind of in a bind here, and you kind of got this reputation of kind of being a tough guy, you know? And, and you know what? It just so happens we're in the need for a tough guy. And so they asked Jephthah, they said, we, we've already mounted our armies, and they're ready to go. But we need somebody, we need a tough guy who can lead the armies. Jephthah says, well, I thought that I was just an outcast. I thought I was a nobody. I, was, I believe that, that I'm just known as an illegitimate child, a child of a prostitute. Y'all kicked me out. You said there was no riches for me, and now you just want me to come back in, and you want me to be the tough guy? You want me to be your champion? He said, the only way I'm going to do this is if you make an oath to me that if I deliver you from the Ammonites, that I'm the big dog in Gilead, that I will rule over all the people. And you swear to God on that. You swear to your God, the one that you claim to worship, you swear to him. And they said, let God deal with us if we do not keep this. You have our word. And it says that they kept their word. He kind of became like the crime boss. And so now he is going to lead this army. But believe it or not, he doesn't just go in and start, you know, kicking and taking names. He, he tries to go about this diplomatically. He sends messengers to the Ammonites. And he, and he seeks to, to, to make an agreement with them. But they really wouldn't have anything of it. They said, you're the ones that came in after you left Egypt. Your, your people came in. And they, and they took our land from him. And he said, whoa, 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 whoa. He, says, he said, I may not be the sharpest on history, but that's not exactly how that happened. He sent another messenger to them and explained how Israel sought safe passage through these, through, um, these countries like Moab and so forth. And they would not get anybody to acquiesce, to allow this to take place. And that hostility grew towards Israel. And Israel, in defense of themselves, then defeated those armies and God dispossessed those people of their land and gave it to Israel. Basically what he's saying is the reason that y'all didn't have, y'all lost your land is because you wouldn't help Israel out and then you tried to wage war against them and then you got yourself handed to them and then God took the land from you. So that he said so really it's not this is I think he got this all wrong. Well, it says that the king of the Ammonites would not hear anything of it and so he declared war on Israel. So Jephthah's messengers come back and give him the news. And Jephthah, it readies the army to be able to go out. But before he goes, he, he tries to have a, a talk with God. Now you have to understand something. Jephthah is a pagan. He is not a singular worshiper of the Lord Yahweh. There are many religious practices that that rabbinic um, writings would tell us about. That's one of the reasons why he is frowned upon so much. But in an effort to just make sure he has all his ducks in a row, he made a vow to God saying this, If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph over the Ammonites... I'll sacrifice it, I'll commit it, I'll dedicate it, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering to you. Well, after this vow, it says that when they go to war, that the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah, and that they passed through Gilead and Manasseh, and that they went there and the Lord gave the Ammonites over to Jephthah and his army. 
Jephthah then defeats the Ammonites, and he returns home to Mitzpah. And then when he comes home, he arrives home in triumph. His only daughter comes running out with a tambourine, dancing in celebration that her daddy is home and that he has won. And in that moment, Jephthah remembers the vow that he made. And it says that rather than picking up his daughter and kissing her on the cheek and swinging her around like a dad should do with his daughter, it says that he was so troubled with anguish that he says that daughter says, your very presence right now is so troubling and vexing to my soul. Why? Because I have made a commitment. The Lord, I have made a commitment, a vow to the Lord, and I will keep my vow. He explains the vow, and his daughter says, the Lord has given over the Ammonites to you. Keep your vow. And all she asks is that she could go away for two months and mourn her virginity and mourn the fact that that she will not be able to live her life and to be able to find that identity and that dignity that was found, that women sought after in that day. We see that in 1 Samuel with, with Hannah, the identity of being a mother, of being married. And then it says this very vaguely that Jephthah kept his vow to the Lord. Now after this, we see a twist in the story. Now we don't see Jephthah as the one who comes in to defend Israel from the enemies of God. But we see the Ephraimites showing up, the, peop the men of Ephraim. It says they were called to arms, the exact same phrasing that the Ammonites, we saw of the Ammonites. Basically, they, have, they, they come for a fight with Gilead. Now, let me remind you, Ephraim is a tribe. Gilead is a tribe. We're on the brink of a, of a civil war. They come in with the same accusation that they came just a few chapters before with Gideon. Remember, Gideon has that great victory, and he comes, and he comes into town, and it says the men of Ephraim were angry. Why? They said, you went to war and didn't invite us, and so now you got all the glory, and we don't get any of the credit. Now, Gideon, he handled it a little bit different than how it was handled here. He was able to diplomatically talk to them and explain to them, says, you've had victories and there, none of this would have been able to happen had you not had this here and had this there. And so it appeased the, the men of Ephraim a few chapters before. But here we see that, um, that, that our judge talks to them and he says that he actually rather than admonishing or giving admiration for their bravery in certain things that they've done, he basically said, he said, look, he said, we called for your help and none of you came. Why would we call for your help again? The reason you don't get any of the credit for this victory is because you were cowards and you stayed home. Well, them be fighting words. And it says that they were so angry and Jephthah said, look, I tried diplomacy with the Ammonites, but now the crime boss is coming out. And so this is what he does. He chases them off. And then they're trying to now flee. Remember, fellow Israelites. And they're trying to flee. And I don't know if you've ever, um, you know, like when you live in different places, you say things a little different. If somebody um, came to you, and, um, and you said, hey, um, you know, the, your vehicle is, uh, you know, your, your vehicle is, is right here. Uh, would you mind moving that? And they, and they say something like this. Sure. I parked the car in the yard. Now, you would immediately know they're not from eastern North Carolina. Why? Because we park the car 
two syllables, car, <laughs> in the yard. We don't park the car in the yard. Well, this was the instructions here given to them. He says that now it says, let's go over. And the men of Gilead said to them, are you Ephraimites? And he says, if they say, if they say yes, or if they say no, we're not. I'm sorry. If they say no, tell them to say Shibboleth. And when they say Sibboleth, because the Ephraimites couldn't say the sh, they, they would say Sibboleth and you pronounce that they are indeed Ephraimites and then you would kill them. And here we see our judge that was picked by the people kills 42,000. Of his fellow Israelites. And that's how. The six year period. Of judging. Ends. Now. That's tragic. Because once again. We're right back in our cycle. Sin. Bondage. Deliverance. Rest, and we're going to see that Israel is going to go right back into it of sin. It's a clouded legacy, in all honesty. That, but I think there is some some things that I want us to to point out before we really get to really what our judge. Is, is really known for. What Jephthah is known for. Um, but I want to I provide some encouragement for those who long to serve in the name of the Lord. There was a couple of things that just kind of stuck out. And I just want you to, I want you to hear this really quick. So, so there's some encouragement for those who are longing to serve in the name of the Lord. But there's also some caution for those who are currently serving in the name of the Lord. Now, if I can remind you of how um, Jephthah is, is introduced to us. How is he introduced to us? He was the son of what? A prostitute. He was an outcast. He wasn't entitled to anything. He was, if, if there was anything that was owed to him, it was taken from him. If there was anyone that would have been disqualified as being a judge for Israel, God's people, you would think it would be the son of a prostitute. But I want, I want to encourage you with this today. Regarding your past, for those who long to serve in the name of the Lord, you need to hear this today. God doesn't disqualify individuals from serving Him. Due to a dishonorable past. Nor, but remember I told you, not only is it an encouragement for those who long to serve. Perhaps maybe, perhaps today that you find yourself or maybe you've been dealing or conversing with someone who is really struggling with whether or not there is an opportunity for them to serve. And perhaps some weight of the past is on them and they're saying there's no way, there's just, I mean, I just got too much baggage you hear me today. God doesn't disqualify individuals because of a dishonorable past. But perhaps today maybe you're, you're in the midst of serving. You're, you are, you're serving. You have um, responsibilities. Or maybe you have certain areas of ministry that you're extremely passionate about. Well, I want to provide encouragement for those wrestling with whether or not that they can serve, but I want to provide caution for you because oftentimes when we get past whether or not we got enough baggage, we, we then immediately wrestle with some other form of sin. And that is this caution here. See, God doesn't disqualify individuals for serving Him due to dishonorable past, nor does He qualify them for service because of a past marked by honor. 
You hear me today? If you have the privilege of ministering or serving in a form or in a capacity in the name of the Lord, it is not because you were deemed honorable by God because of your past achievements or because of an honorable or maybe a a pedigree that you have. Maybe because of a Christian heritage that all of a sudden that qualifies you. You need to hear me today. God doesn't disqualify people because of a dishonorable past. And he doesn't qualify people because of an honorable past. You say, well, okay. Well, what, what, what are you trying to say? Rather this. You hear this. Those whom God chooses for service are chosen according to His providence and His grace. Demonstrating that He is sovereign over all aspects of our lives. You say, how do we see this in the life of Jephthah? Okay, son of a prostitute. An illegitimate child. We don't know who your daddy is. Get out of our town. Okay, so we've got, we've got Jephthah, and then we've got, we've got the children of Israel over here saying, God, we need help. God, we need help. But then when they see the army, they say, who's the man? Where are we going to find somebody? Who's going to be the tough guy for us? They went about it all wrong, even in the midst of poor choices, even in the midst of a lack of faith. Even in the midst of a lack of trust in God. Even in the midst of them picking the guy. God is sovereignly in control. And they thought they raised up Jephthah. No. God raised up Jephthah. So in light of your past today. Maybe you're wrestling with service. I got too much baggage in my life. You understand me. That is not a disqualifier. God chooses by grace, according to His Word, according to His will, according to His providence, according to His grace. God chooses who will serve in the name of the Lord. Perhaps you're in the midst of it today. You hear me. You better be leery of pride. Thinking that the reason you're where you are right now because you hold that position, because, you're, because you have that responsibility, you better be careful. Because God didn't say, oh man, I hope I can get that one. Man, they're just so clean. They're so right. They do everything. You better be careful of that. You'll start believing in your own stock. Just as he doesn't disqualify because of a dishonorable past, he didn't pick you because you're so good. Be careful in light of your past regarding the past. But what about the future? What about the future? You hear me today. We see in the life of Jephthah. Because we do believe God is all-knowing, right? That means before Jephthah was even raised up, God knew about the foolish vow. Right? God knew about, about about his... uh, cr- being the crime boss. God knew about how he was going to treat fellow tribesmen. He, God, God knew about all that, right? You hear this regarding your future? Because maybe you're battling this today. Well, if I start serving God, if I start serving in the name of the Lord, what about if I mess up? You hear me. God doesn't disqualify individuals from serving Him due to a dishonorable future. That means that God doesn't look at the past and say, okay, it was dishonorable, but once I pick you, it's got to be completely perfect all the way to the end. No mistakes. It's not going to be, oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Because the father up above has got a big baseball bat and I'll squash you like a bug. No. Hear me. God uses sinners. Not just those who struggled with sin in the past. But that's the big word, struggles. 
But God uses sinners who are still struggling right now. God still calls people like Peter. Who even after following him for three and a half years. Still takes out a sword and tries to cut the guy's head off. What about if God had told Peter and said. Follow me. Oh wait a minute. I forgot about Malchus. You can't follow me. No, you hear me today. God doesn't call you because he knows you're going to be perfect or you're going to have now producing this honorable, you know, flawless future. Nor does he qualify people because he knows that they are going to have a future that's marked with honor. No, God calls people and chooses people to serve because he's God and because he's gracious. Nobody here, you hear me, hear me now, no one here is worthy of being used by God. Nobody. But there's not a single person here that's too dirty for God not to use. We look into the life of Jephthah and we sit here and we should praise the Lord because I'm Jephthah. I'm the one who's got things stained in my past and I've got things that are still staining in the future and yet God says, I'll use you for my glory. Not because of you. But because I'm a great God. You hear me today? Be encouraged by this God. It says that Jephthah judged Israel six years. And then he died. And he was buried. But I want to get to the elephant in the room. Jephthah kind of puts a black eye on Christianity and on the Bible. Because of human sacrifice. Because of a, pardon my language, but stupid vow. Dumb. Ignorant. What is the lesson that we can learn from him today? See, this is an accusation that those, that that anti-God people will say, they'll say, see, I mean, God is condoning here human sacrifice. Where does it say that God condoned or God honored the vow of him? You understand, God had already said he was going to put them into his hand. God had already promised this over and over again. How many times have we seen God, not on the merit or on the actions of anyone, that he has put put the enemies of the Lord into the hands of the Israelites? How many times? Hear me today. God didn't need no stinking vow. He didn't need it. But I got two questions lingering in my brain that I would like to pose to you. Now, I don't want you to answer out loud, but maybe you can answer them in your head. And I'm going to give you just a couple of thoughts from me. Here's my first question. Why did he make the vow? Why? Why? If we just stop, I mean, have you ever, uh, I know parents, you can identify this with me. There's been some times where some things maybe have gotten broken at the house or maybe there's been disruption or there's been, um, there's been argument between my two sons and, and, and I'm sitting here and it's like, I come in and it's like, I just sit there and I'm just kind of like, why? What, in what universe did you think this was a good idea? Why? Now, be honest with you, Jessica does that more with me than I do that with Jaden and Jordan. Why? I'm asking that question here. Why did he make the vow? Now, we've already emphasized this. Jephthah was a pagan, raised pagan. 
an outcast from Israel, had seen idolatry worship, had probably seen a lukewarm, half-hearted, turning back to God, perhaps, you know, have my cake and eat it too type of religion. And here we, we see some of this. And by the way, that's what Judges is, is basically the canonization of Israel. That's really what it is. We're seeing this lingering influence of all these cities and all these nations that have come in and oppressed over time. And we're seeing some of this influence here. So for me, I believe a question that has to be asked, did God, did, did Jephthah really believe God to be different than from all the other gods? See, with the other gods, you would, you would, you would try to buy their favor. So perhaps he thought that this professed reliance would impress God. Or perhaps he he thought his vow would then obligate God. Okay, so let's let's just stop for a moment. In, In this relationship that whatever this relationship is with God, he thought for a moment there was something that he could do to impress God. To garner a sense of admiration from him. And in this relationship with him, he thought there was something that he could do that would then obligate God to give him what he wanted. I think there's something glaring here. Why did he make the vow? I think he thought his offering would only cost him something that he didn't really want or need. I mean, if, if he were able to take the rewind button... Okay, you know, like, you know, some of those movies where, you know, they go back into the back in time. They're able to see themselves in the moment. You, you know, do you think Jephthah would, if he was able to step back here and say, hey, 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 it's going to be your daughter that's going to come out first. You think he would made the vow? No. Some thought that it might have been, some thought that it might have been, that he thought that it was going to be livestock that would have just been wandering out. I mean, if in the Middle East, that was, that was fairly common. But in the language here, it, there probably would have been in the tents, there would have been a neuter. No, I think that, that he legitimately thought it was going to be either a servant or it was, going to be, um, it was going to be just someone that probably he just relationally didn't really care much about. I really believe that he was thinking human sacrifice here. But I don't think he thought it was going to be his only daughter. Why did he make the vow? Can I ask you today, in this relationship that you have with God, are you doing things because you think that they impress him? Are you making these outlandish acts of service or these vows or you're keeping these some commitments maybe that you've had since you were so young? Why? Because you think that this is going to impress God and give you some type of status with him? Or do you think that, and this is running, pre, this is prevalent in, Christ, in the Christian world today. We've talked about it in, in the prosperity gospel, word of faith. And that, that, that you think that there's certain things that because you do them, that it obligates God to do something for you. In other words, God becomes your butler. Or maybe because you're doing those things because you just don't, you hadn't counted the cost. You hear me right now. If you're doing it for any of those reasons, you're treating God like he's another God. You, you're treating him like, you, you, listen, you might as well be pagan. Ask yourself today, why do you do what you do? Think about it. Why do you come to church? I hear it often. 
They talk, people are talking about how they want to read the Bible through in a year. By the way, that is wonderful. You're not going to get an argument from me that you need less word in your life. Why, why do you pray? Why do you do the things that you do? Are you doing it because you think you impress God? Like, you, you think that it's because... Like you're going to gain some type of status with him that you didn't pre- already have on the account of his son? Or do you think it's because, or, or do you do those things because you want something? You do, you do things because you want your kids to be safe. By the way, there's nothing wrong with wanting your kids to be safe. But you need to hear me right now. There have been a lot of people who love Jesus who have lost their children. That type of theology spits in the face of God's faithfulness and grace in the lives of those people. Perhaps if they had just done a little bit more, is that where that theology is going to chase us down that trail? Well, then I ask you, what is enough? Why did he make the vow? But I got a second question. That's burning in my brain. Why did he keep the vow? Now, you would say, well, because it was to the Lord. And you don't lie to the Lord because then he does take out that that divine baseball bat. Now, that would imply that God desires your word over his moral law. Why did he keep the vow? Well, he said he kept it. He said that he was going to keep it because he made this vow. He promised God this. Have you ever promised God something? Listen, if you've promised God something and it's illegal, it's going to hurt somebody, it's going to kill them, Guess what? God is not expecting you to honor that vow. He's, he is saying, look, you're an idiot. Don't do that. Don't do that. By the way, God already made a provision in his law for this. Deuteronomy teaches us that if someone would make a vow to someone or even to God, if they were and and it was and it was something that was morally going to hurt someone else, mortally hurt someone else, all they had to do was pay ten shekels. And it would be recognized as a vow fulfilled. Why? Because God valued the moral law. But here, why did he keep it? I believe it's this. I believe he had a flawed understanding of the God that he was praying to. He saw God just as the other pagan gods of the day. One that favor had to be earned through flattery and lavish sacrifices. But also, and this is one that was very helpful for me this morning. I think he had a misguided distrust in God. God was a divine mercenary for him. He came to God because he wanted to kill Ammonites. He wanted to be the ruler over Gilead. And God could potentially be the means in which he could get there. He had a misguided distrust in God. He kept kept the vow because he didn't trust God's law and he didn't trust God's character. He seemed to have believed that God would have struck him dead if he didn't keep it. Parents, Is there something in you that would say, strike me dead? Not my baby. Not my child. 
Lord, here's the ten shekels. And if it's not good enough, strike me dead. But don't take my baby. But no. Jephthah was still desiring something else. Maybe there was something in him that wanted to be known as the one who kept his oath, who kept his word when God had already made provisions for him. So I ask you this today, and then we're done. I hope that perhaps the areas of exhortation for service about the past and the future has been an encouragement to you. I, ha- I hope that perhaps it's been challenging you to examine why you do the things that you do. Are you doing them because you're trying to impress God or you're trying to obligate God to something? Why, do you, why, are, you, why are you staying fixed on certain things? Is it, is it because you're afraid? Is it because you don't trust God? Perhaps we can examine our lives today with these things. But I've got one more question, and this is an application. How in the world do we connect this to Jesus? Because if all we do is do that, then, listen, we're no different than um, the synagogues. We, can be at, we could be at Mass. We can be at all these other places where all, the, all they're going to do is give you moral imperatives, behavior modifications, okay? Nice little things to think about. But that's not why we're here. We're here because we got to get to Jesus. Because the Bible is all about Him. Perhaps today we can see once again a breadcrumb of an enemy conquered at the cost of an only begotten who didn't deserve to die but whose life was willingly laid down so that a father's promise would be kept. Of course, there's main points that we just mentioned that provide similarities. But there are some things that are drastically different in the narrative, though. You see, unlike Jephthah's daughters, or daughter, Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, had to lay down his life. There was no provision in the law to avoid it. There was no other way. Because before the foundations of the world, before creation, before sin entered the world, the Father laid out his plan of deliverance for his people. But this plan wasn't a random sacrifice left to chance with hopes that it would cost nothing or just a little. No, this plan was set in motion by God knowing that it would cost him everything. It was a plan that the Son of God himself would step in, be born into this world to live a perfect life and to suffer and to be tempted. And to die. But unlike this story. There's no need. For there to be four days set aside of mourning each year. Because God the Father. Vindicated. The selfless sacrifice of the only begotten. And raised him from the dead. And sin has been conquered. And one day, this same Jesus that left this earth will return for his children. There's no need for mourning today. Judges leaves us void of hope. But the gospel gives us the hope that we need. So you hear me today. Why did Jephthah make the vow? Why did he keep the vow? I can't understand. But I'm telling you, I'm thankful that the Father made the vow. And I'm thankful that through the Son, 
the Father kept the vow. For that is the hope that we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can we pray together? Father, thank you for time in your word. And Lord, at times, whenever the scriptures get dark, we thank you that the gospel, like a candle, shines light and we can find Jesus. I pray that this challenges us today. It helps us to examine, Lord, are we believers? Or have we, do we have some graven image that we have developed and built in our own minds? We believe God to be like the other pagan gods. That someone that we can manipulate, that we can impress, that we can lavish so that we can get what we want. So that we can impress him and we can gain status. I pray God that you will convict us of that. That you will point that out in our lives. Why do we do the things that we do? But today, Lord, above everything else, I pray, God, that we are thankful and that we express our gratitude for Jesus. Who, Lord, for on our account, came and lived, suffered, tempted, and died. Lord, was rejected and forsaken so that we wouldn't have to be. Thank you for the promise of the gospel. And I pray, Lord, as we depart from this place, Lord, that will echo in our words. That will echo in our actions. That will reverberate through our neighborhoods and our communities and in our relationships. Lord, help us. Because that will only come from you. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. And we need it. We need it more and more. Sanctify us, we pray. In your name, amen. Let's stand together. My church family, my brothers and sisters in Christ, there's a blessing that's been reserved for you. It's already been given. I pray that you will be encouraged by it, you will embrace it, and you will live it out. So hear these words. May the Father's hand keep you from stumbling. May the life of the Son give you confidence to follow faithfully. And may the presence of the Spirit comfort you and encourage you as you go into this world. This is your blessing. Take it. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.